Good evening. Hello, thank you for coming. You know, I just put my phone on uh, airplane mode. Did you turn yours off? A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of little announcements before we get going. Um, we just started a new digital newsletter, uh, which is called Design News, and you can sign up for it if you just go to cooperhewitt.org and sign up, and then um, you receive it on a regular basis. So please give that a try. And uh, please don't forget to friend us and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we've got uh, live streaming going on right now, so welcome to those on, on YouTube who are watching from anywhere in the world. Um, and in terms of the series of these talks, our next one after this evening will be in two weeks from today uh, with Emily Oberman. Um, you know, she had a, uh, a firm called Number 17, but she's just actually moved over and joined Pentagram. And so she does a really interesting mix of communications in print and in, in media. So she's a very good filmmaker, too. Um, April the 12th, we have Annabelle Seldorf, who is an architect interested in sustainability. She actually designed the Sunset Park Recycling Center in Brooklyn. So it'd be interesting to hear about that. May the 24th, Scott Wilson. He's an industrial designer, but also an amazing entrepreneur. He came up with this idea of having an iPod Nano and making it into a watch and then making a strap for it. And then he got Kickstarter funding for that. And uh, it's so successful, it's available in all the Apple stores. So interesting in example of a mixture of the new kind of entrepreneurial funding plus the interesting design. And Walter Hood, who's a landscape architect, is coming in from Oakland, California to tell us about his work in landscape, community, and public space. Um, I'm very excited this evening to have not just Helen Walters with us, but also um, Fiona Morrison and Beth Finer. Um, but I'm going to be really selfish and start myself by grabbing the stage and keeping it for about 10 minutes, because I thought you might be interested in my own ideas about design thinking. I'm quite interested in it. Um, so could we move on to the first slide there? Um, this is an interesting illustration, which was done for B Mercedes um, by Shalmor, I can't pronounce this, Amichai, I think, um, from YNR Interactive in Israel. Um, and she's trying to illustrate the idea of the difference between the two halves of the brain, the left brain and the right brain, um, the so-called creative half and the logical half. Um, I think the thing that's interesting about that is that we all have both and we all use both in some proportion. Um, but if you think of the arts in general, they tend to be thought of as right brain. And if you think of logical things like science, they tend to be thought of as left brain. Um, and I think of design thinking perhaps as a combination of those two in that um, if you think about any designer who's trying to solve a problem, they will really use a mixture of that logic and that intuitive thinking. Um, so the left brain being the design thinking, and then the right brain being more the design process, the um, learning by doing, the tacit knowledge, the, make, the making, uh, the, the, the sort of intuitive way of behaving. Um, so you could say that every designer of any kind is um, an, a design thinker, except perhaps if it's really purely for just the craft. And if you think about those traditional crafts like designing glass or pottery, things that are really evolved through the making, through the intuitive process, then they probably don't really need that left brain. They just need to get very good. And a great example, if we could look at these series of slides, Ava Zeisel, whose 105-year-long um, life we celebrated at the beginning of this series, um, describes herself as not interested in innovation at all. She's only interested in getting perfection of her craft. So she really does or did operate purely on the right brain. Um, you can see here the, uh, the beautiful salt cellars um, and um, vessels that she designed in 1946. And another 1946 example. Look at the next one, though. And you see this is designed in 2003. And it looks remarkably similar. So she's been evolving and perfecting that way of doing some 
a making craft intuitively. So perhaps she's a kind of designer who didn't need design thinking, just needed the process of getting better and better at craft. Um, now, back to this double thing. You know, I think if you're a talented designer, the chances are you're schizophrenic uh, and that you really don't know which of those two you are in. Are you a right brain person? Well, some of the time. Are you a left brain person? Yes. I mean, I think about things really carefully. Um, well, I do have to go into this right brain thing where I do lots of sort of drawings and sketches and try to get myself interested. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit schizophrenic, I'm afraid. Um, okay. So um, the other way I think people are describing design thinking, rather than being applicable to everybody, is a relatively recent idea which was coined in the 90s um, for it being to do with interdisciplinary teams who employ design methods and processes, but they do it um, in teams of people collaborating together. And so I think this little hierarchy of you know, design awareness and design practice and design thinking might be a, a way of uh, trying to see how that fits with the rest of design. So I'll just take you through some examples of that. Um, so if we think about design awareness, which is really about how to choose, you know, people do that in their everyday lives, don't they? I mean, everybody makes design decisions about what they wear and what they have in their gardens and how they decorate their apartment or house. And so they're making design choices day by day. And, and here, um, Don Norman uh, describes that as a form of design in that, uh, that he's saying that those choices are actually a form of design. Um, but they're choosing from uh, a set of things that you can choose from as opposed to in creating the new ones. Um, if we think more about design practice, which is the doing of the design um, in the, all the different disciplines, um, then I think um, you can see this mix of the schizophrenic behavior that I described earlier being applied in all the design disciplines that we recognize. And the design awards that we have at Cooper Hewitt are a very good way of seeing a snapshot of that. So let's just go through last year's um, winners. This is Rick Valicenti for communications. So this is sort of graphic design, very full of ideas, definitely schizophrenic. Um, if you think of uh, interaction design, very high tech, you'd say that that was even more likely to be thoughtful in terms of the left brain component, but certainly intuitive as well. Um, then you think of product design. Well, yes, lots of problem solving there. So another schizophrenic person. Hello, Gianfranco. Mm -hmm. um, architecture, I think similar story, really. Um, perhaps a little more division sometimes that the uh, engineering component of architecture tends to be different people sometimes, but definitely architects would think of themselves as both left and right. Um, and intu interior design in the same sort of way. Um, then uh, landscape architecture, yes, I mean, same story. Fashion, perhaps you could exist in a more intuitive world. I mean, you could be a fashion designer as a career without relying too much on logical thinking, mostly on intuitively. It's closer, perhaps, to craft, but still a bit of both, I would say. And uh, when it comes to design mind, somebody like uh, Steve Heller, you know, is definitely on the leftish side of design. He's He's not got much operational right brain stuff, although he obviously enjoys it. And um, if you think about Matthew Carter, the design of typefaces, all those ones you have on your screens, he probably designed. Um, yes, I mean, that really is close to craft, I think. The perfection of the serif on a type font is something that you do learn by trying it over and over again in an intuitive way. So, so there isn't so much of the left brain there. Um, I do think that most of the public, though, tend to fall into this category where they, they think of designers in rather a, um, an archetypal kind of way. And perhaps the, the lamp or, or the, the chair are very good examples of that. Um, and these are a couple of lights that were designed by guys from Switzerland. Um, you know, so the one on the right is uh, by Yves Behar from Fuse Project. That was designed quite recently for Herman Miller. Um, but it's a classic light design. The one on the left by Richard Sapper was designed in the 60s in Italy, but both these guys are from Switzerland. Um, I don't know whether Switzerland has anything to do with it, really. Probably not. Um, and then to my final uh, um, level on that hierarchy, getting into this design thinking with interdisciplinary teams, 
This was really largely developed with Tim Brown's leadership at IDEO, in my experience, at any rate, as an IDEO person. And Tim draws this diagram where he says that design thinking is different from other kinds of thinking in terms of the starting point. So if you think about uh, the all innovation really coming from the mixture, the middle point, the overlap of that Venn diagram where you have business and technology and people coming together. And you think of scientific innovation starts really with technology and then they start looking for the money and they look for the customer. Whereas the money people, they tend to start with the idea of the financial aspect of it, I can make a buck and then they look for the customer and they, uh, they look for the technology. Whereas designers, we tend to start with the people. We still have to look for the money and for the technology, but the starting point is a little different. Um, let me move on to the next slide and show you a little video. riding a bike as a kid is um, going down the hill with my hands up in the air and just going wee! <laughs> my first major bike that I got that I really loved was a five-speed Schwinn. The bicycle really was my passport to try seeing new places. I gotta say it felt great to ride that bike. It felt really freeing and it did give me that wow wee kind of feeling again. Very easy, very easy to ride. First of all the uh, the coasting brake, sweet. I love the coasting brake. The positioning just felt really easy. Like I could wear, have any clothing on that I want to put on, I could ride to the store, ride to, to work and, and feel like I, it's ready to go. So this was an example of Shimano, who were you know, very strong component manufacturers for bicycles, coming to IDEO and asking for help in deciding what to do next, because they were worried that they would lose their dominant market share just because it was already full. I mean, they'd got every bicycle that was to do with high performance pretty much in America. Um, and they saw Armstrong coming to the end of his career and wondered what to do next. And the research with this interdisciplinary team revealed that there were a whole lot of people who used to ride bikes when they were kids, loved it, but they were put off by going into the bike stores nowadays because all these young people were so athletic and they had Lycra and, and you know, they kind of felt embarrassed about it. So, um, so they went choosing to go and think of a bicycle as a way of getting around. So the idea of this was a set of components that would allow you to get on a bike without ever having to do anything that looked and felt at all athletic. So you have the, uh, the computer that's generated by the electricity in one hub that changes gears automatically. Um, so you don't have to put on any special shoes, you don't have to change any le levers, you just get on the bike, ride, and, and you're away. Um, so this idea seemed very successful as a form of um, design thinking emerging from this interdisciplinary team, in that it told the Shimano as a design company what they could be doing in the future. However, for people who are interested in design craft, it's not a very nice story because Shimano actually makes those components and then Trek or Rally or somebody makes the bicycles. And they're, they're the things that are bought by the user. So when you go down the high street, you used to be able to say to your mum, hey mum, I designed that bicycle. But now you have to say, hey mum, I designed the strategy that convinced Shimano to build the components that allowed them to sell them to the companies that designed that bicycle. That's not such an easy story. So the design thinking tends not to be kind of quite so satisfying if you're thinking about design practice and design craft. Okay, thank you, let's have the next one. So just flicking through the components there, those are the components they made, yes. And this is the website to support this easy form of riding. Um, and that's the bikes themselves, okay. Um, so we think of this sort of innovation as being based on, if you want to go from the left bottom quadrant there to the right bottom quadrant, you just want to get something a bit cheaper, you're a bit better or more beautiful or something, you can just move straight across in an evolutionary sense. But if you want to do something that's really different, innovative, new, then to go in this abstract zone up in the top area is part of that process. So I think the design thinkers in these interdisciplinary teams 
tend to have to go into this abstract world where they do research first, they generate alternatives, and then they create new ideas. Okay, now is the time for me to introduce the real star of the evening. So, Helen, can you join us? <laughs> Hello. Um, so, you just want me to start? Yeah, go on. Okay, so first of all, please take that awful picture off. Thank you. It's just such a big face. Um, so thank you, Bill. I thought it was a nice picture. I, I know, my hair looks really dirty. Hair, too, you know? I mean, I like the pink. I just needed to wash my hair that day. I didn't, hadn't, hadn't realised. Um, so I wanted to thank Bill for, so much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm just completely blown away and honoured to be here and, and for you guys all to turn out to hear me uh, bloviate. And I'm really excited to hear Fiona and Beth, too, talk about this topic, which... It's one that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I'm really happy that Bruce Nussbaum is in the audience because he was the person who really first introduced me to the concept of design thinking when I worked for him at Business Week. <clears throat> well, he's right back in the middle, so we can shoot straight at him. I know. He's right here to heckle, which is actually really <laughs> unfortunate and unkind. Um, so I'll try not to let you down, Bruce. Um, um, but, what, but what has been really interesting to me recently is that um, I've been working for a company called Dublin, and one of the things that I've been doing while I've been there um, is going through the archives. And Dublin was founded in 1981 by Jay Dublin, who is this legendary, renowned industrial designer who had um, you know, uh, worked with all of the major industrial design firms um, in the 50s and 60s. And then he founded uh, his own design firm, or he founded Dublin in 1981. And I came across this piece that he'd written actually in 1978 to talk about design-led innovation. And I was reading it, and it's kind of amazing. Um, and, I, and I unearthed this... Um, this um, diagram that he'd drawn about the redesign or how to redesign the, the gas, gasoline pump, petrol pump, gas pump, pe petrol pump. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so I wanted to share that with you first. It's like it takes you through the kind of seven levels of the designer and the, the seven levels of the design process. So if we can go to the next one. Okay, I'm going to read these out. So the designer accepts the pump's performance but shortens and cleans up its form. So this is kind of the traditional um, industrial design challenge, right? So you, you know, the, the designer is looking at the, uh, the form of a product. And then performance improvements are made, either money, gallonage, or Philip. I had to look that up, I didn't know what that meant. Can be punched directly, inserted credit card, automatically bills the customer. So remember this was 78, so this is a pretty radical idea, the credit card, you know, pumping, putting that into the machine was not a very common idea. But so this is elevating design somewhat. And then the third, kind of moving up this chain, changes the basic mechanism. The station is like a parking lot where hoses are pulled from trapdoors below ground. All the controls are on the nozzle. So again, it's becoming more, more complex, more more sophisticated as you move up. <clears throat> so number four involves products which are outside the company's control, so extending the business model of, um, from away from the actual product and the form factor to, to be more of a service design. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, no liquid fuel is pumped, pressurized cartridges are inserted into the car, one cartridge fits all car, like sealed beam headla headlamps, a one price sale. So really kind of thinking about the, the, whole, the whole of the design, thinking about the car as well as the petrol pump. Uh, the next one is the service performed is changed. There are no more gas stations. Fuel cartridges are bought anywhere like beer, which I have to say is a really unnerving thing to think about beer and cars <laughs> in the same thing, but it was the 70s, so we'll let it slide. Um, and then it's getting kind of out of control, right? The next two are just bonkers. This one, the service is eliminated. Cars never need refueling. They run indefinitely on atomic power. And the last one, my favorite of all, transportation is eliminated. All human contact is by telecommunications. <laughs> and so Jay, Jay was no fool. I sadly never got to meet him. He, he died in the 80s. But, um, you know, he, he understood that this was ludicrous and that this, these kind of ideas were really kind of pushing at the boundaries of what is accepted. But what I think is amazing is that back in, the 19, back in 1978, we were kind of thinking about how to define design and, and kind of where design fitted in and how, how, what the designer's role was. And, and I can't tell if it's great or depressing that we're still having some of these same conversations now and we still don't have many of the answers. <clears throat> So if you can move to the next slide. So the theme of what I wanted to say, and I, <coughs> sorry, I promise I won't go on too long, but really what I want to talk about is language. <coughs> if I can speak, I'm so sorry. Um, There's water if you want. I think I'm all right. I think I'm just, I'm fine, thank you. 
Um, and so I think one of the design thinking one, it's one, it's a topic that really gets people het up. It really gets people motivated either with kind of fury and anger or, or excitement and passion. And it's kind of unleashed a whole new level of discussion, I think, which is really important. But what I think it has um, exemplified to a certain extent is the confusion around design that, 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 that persists. So if you think about the medical profession, I think about you know, all of the different specializations that, that you have within medicine. And so we know about physicians, we know about surgeons, we know about neurologists, we know about gynecologists, you know, we know about all of these specializations and we probably don't understand the complexity of what these people are actually doing. But we do have a sense that we know what they do to an extent as a, as a lay person, as a patient, as a, as a regular human being. And in the design community, even though Bill just showed us the National Design Awards, which I think are a good kind of cross-section of what design can offer, I think there's much less understanding about, about what design can do and about what designers do. And I think it's really problematic when we're thinking about design thinking. If, if you say to somebody, you know, I'm a designer, then the person you're talking to has a very clear idea of what that is, but it might not actually be accurate at all to actually what you do. And I think that's really prob problematic and has real implications for how design can kind of persist in, in business and how design can actually make a difference in the world. So, um, it was really interesting as I was preparing for this, for this talk, for this evening, for this lovely gathering, um, I got some pushback. Um, from people who are not really happy about the idea of design practice versus design thinking and kind of these, these dichotomies that we have and people were just like, especially people who haven't been immersed in this discussion were a bit like, well, what are you talking about? You know, are you implying that design practitioners don't think? That's weird because obviously they do. And, then, and, and so it, it, I was kind of interested in that and I think what I'm thinking is, is kind of akin to what Bill was saying, is that this isn't about either or, this is about and, this is about both. Um, but I did also want to pull up to talk about the ads that you showed, those Mercedes ads, which caused a bit of a stir when they came out. And, and they are so beautiful, the illustrations are so beautiful. But they're such nonsense. I can't, I can't stand them because what they do is they say that you know, the right-hand side of the brain is all technicolor and gorgeous and flowing and amazing and creative and exploratory and all the rest of it. And then the left brain, people are really gray and drab and dull and boring. And I just think that's nonsense, you know? I mean, I've worked with, you know, at, at Dob Dublin is part of a much bigger strategy consultancy, and so I've had the opportunity to work with people who are super left brain, and holy shit, these guys are so creative, and I know that financial innovation is not something that we're particularly excited about these days, but it is amazing to see the creativity that goes into this work and the way that analysts can look at data and they can grok this stuff into just kind of meaningful insights that can really help, and I think that's amazing, and I think that to kind of set up the right hand, the right side of the brain as this kind of <clears throat> the, the only creative powerhouse is really is really unfortunate. And, and similarly, I've worked with designers who just blow my mind. You know, they're just so creative and they're so incredible, and they come up with solutions for things that you just you have no idea how they got there, but you're so excited to see that they did that. And I think we have to celebrate rather than trying to get everybody to be everything. We should be celebrating what people are good at. You know, be good at what you're good at and be happy about that and be as good as you possibly can. And then, and then you also have to, I guess we have to develop empathy. And that's something that designers always talk about, but develop empathy for those other people. So it's not a question of setting up an opposition, but it is a question of, of um, learning how to, to, to kind of understand other people. And that gets back to my, my idea about language. What I'm really passionate about is figuring out a way that we can all talk the same language and we can all be understood and we can make each other understood, we make ourselves understood within any context. So I did want to dive into, thank you very much, um, just being a little bit more specific about design thinking. And obviously I, I bring a huge, I uh, bring huge baggage to this topic having covered it at Business Week. Um, but so in my experience, and I'm sure lots of people have other experiences, but in my experience, design thinking um, has become or is, is, is used as a process often within really big companies, the big companies that have the biggest difficulties in innovating because they are the least nimble, the least flexible, the least able to change. They're super tankers, so changing is really super hard. And design thinking has, has been introduced as this incredibly useful process by which you can bring people together 
and you can and you can put people in the room and again to echo something that bill had said is that we talk about interdisciplinary teams it's like t it's like a cliche to talk about this now but it's so important the the problems that we face as as a society are so complex that no one person can solve them and what we need is for people to be able to come together and be able to sit around a table wherever it is and be able to share insights and again this comes back to my language issue of if you if you're not speaking in the same, you know, at the same level, then how can you be understood and how can you actually make the change that you're all purporting to be there for? Um, I, was just at, I was just at the TED conference and um, David Kelly, who um, is obviously the founder of IDEO with Bill, um, gave a talk in the design session and, and, and his new mission is, is to kind of stop the world from dividing people into creative and non-creative people and it's, he's just really, when, when the talk goes live you should all hunt it down because it's just a really beautiful and lyrical and poetic introduction to these ideas for people not within that community and, and I loved, he, he described a workshop <clears throat> that they'd done at IDEO I guess at some point and so all of these people are there, the big wigs, the hotshots, the CEOs are there, you know, the C-suite and everyone's, you know, have a getting going at this kind of workshop thinking and everything is fine until it gets difficult. And so everybody, anyone who's ever worked in, in this field will knows that, you know, shit's going to get difficult at some point. And, and he said it was a, remarkable because as soon as it got difficult, like the, the Blackberries would come out and people were like, oh, I've got a very important email, I have to answer this now, I have to take this call. And so they all left the room just at the moment when they really needed to be doubling down and really getting on with it. And so he, he said that he asked someone, he's like, what's going on, what are you doing? And you know, the answer invariably was, I'm just not that creative, this bit's not for me, you guys sort this bit out and I'll, I'll be back when, you know, when that's done. And this is such a shame. This is such a shame. It's a shame and it's honestly a tragedy that this, that this is kind of the way that we've set ourselves up. And I see the same thing honestly happening in the design community too. I think it's, it's honestly criminal how, how badly equipped we're sending out our graduates often. They, they don't know what a P&L sheet is. They don't know the very simplest business um, information or how to run a business and I think not everyone has to run a business but I think that we have to be moving towards speaking the same language I'm just going to repeat myself a lot but but <clears throat> at least have the same kind of basic foundational knowledge so that we can all start to move and start to apply these things in a way that will actually make the difference that we want um, I don't really know what happened. I feel like, you know, when you're a kid, you, there's always a willingness to learn. There's always, you know, you, well, you have to learn. You have to go to school and you have to, you know, you have to do something. But somehow when you enter real life, when you become a grown-up and you enter the, the office, you're not, allowed to, you're not allowed to not know anymore. You're not allowed to not know an answer. You have to, you know, you have to know everything. And that's just nonsense. Again, we, we don't know everything. And we need to kind of change the culture so that we can be more more comfortable with complete, um, you know, with not knowing, I suppose. And I think one other thing, and then I promise I'll stop talking, yeah. is that um, we've all, we, it's, it's great to feel like you're part of a tribe, right? It's great to feel like you're part of something and you're, you know, you, you're part of a gang and you've got your special kind of sign language and your coded language and everybody, you know, you understand it and no one else does and that's really cool. And it is really cool, but we have to also realize that this patois, this kind of, this jargon has just infiltrated society to such an extent that we're not really making sense anymore half the time. And if we're not making sense, then how can we really expect to, um, to change anything? And I just, I just, and I, I don't mean to get political, but I just noticed um, that the... <sighs> Okay, this just really annoyed me, so I'm going to share it. But the um, the bill the bill in Pennsylvania about mandatory ultrasounds is called the Women's Right to Know Act, and this double speak is not helpful. This double speak is going to kill our society, and I think that we have to do something about this. And my humble suggestion is that we all that we all just rein it in, and then we just start to speak in English again, and then we just English in this culture will work. But just speak common language and try to make ourselves understood and be open to other people and then that's how we will be able to make the difference that we want to see. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the barriers, of course, you know, for people who are in a big organization like the one you talked about is that they've been in these narrow silos for so long. I mean, they decided they wanted to become some form of specialist scientist or business career, 
or legal career, whatever it might be, before they actually went to university. And then as they went through university, they get to be more and more specialist. Then they move into a, an organization like a large company, and they're increasing the nature of that specialty. And then suddenly somebody comes along and says, try this design thinking thing. Just get in the room and collaborate with all these people with completely different backgrounds. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, people, we just all have to be a little bit more sensitive to each other. We have to understand that this is difficult. And we have to take away this kind of culture of judgment where, you know, this, this is going to be weird and this is going to be uncomfortable. But I have to say, when I, when I first joined Dublin, I, I, I kind of went on, they do these workshops to kind of help people think about this kind of thing. And I, and I, I went and it was so interesting to see these executives and they were so grumpy. They were so cross to be there. They didn't want to be there at all. They wanted to be on their Blackberry. They were really busy. For heaven's sake, what am I doing here? And it was like a, a three-day event. And you saw this shift kind of halfway through when suddenly it was just like, wait a minute, this isn't abstract. This isn't totally abstract. This is actually really useful. I can actually apply this in my own work. Holy shit, okay, count me in, I'm that. And the end of the workshop was just this kind of astonishing, like come to Jesus moment of like, suddenly we had all these evangelists and it was kind of alarming. But I think, you know, you just have to, you, you have to just kind of give people a break. You have to treat people the way that you would like to be treated if you were trying to learn something new. I mean, these people are, if you're a scientist and you're, you know, deeply embedded in your science work, you're going to be really smart. And there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to, you know, grok this stuff. I think there is a tendency to get a backlash, though, if you try these methods and they don't succeed quickly. And then, then people say, oh, that doesn't work. You know, so yeah, that tends yeah. to, once something gets popularized and accepted as a rational thing to try, and then unless it's quickly successful, it often suffers a backlash. And I think we've seen that happening in the last few years yeah. with the idea of design thinking. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think it's really important that it isn't set up. And I think I meant to say this and forgot, but um, it's not a panacea. You know, this isn't the, the quick fix that everyone is looking for. Innovation is really, really hard work. If it were easy, then our world would be a better place. You know, then everyone would be at it. But the, the, the failure rate of innovation is just enormously high. But um, yeah, so it, I think it's just a framing issue of design thinking is an incredibly useful and powerful process that can help. But in order to innovate successfully, you have to think about a whole lot more than just processes. You have to, for instance, just one example that springs to mind is thinking about internal culture and thinking about the kind of the, 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 um, the bed that you have, the bedding that you have in which you're trying to plant these seedlings. You know, are you, are you planting on rocks or are you planting on, you know, delicious fertilized soil? <laughs> um, I must say, I, I take um, comfort from the fact that young people are so readily adaptable. I was lucky enough to teach um, a class in the Stanford D School um, for a few years before coming to New York. And it was just amazing. Um, the idea of the D School is that you have uh, students from these different MA programs. So you put together teams from people from completely different backgrounds. They're not trying to get a design degree. They're in the D School in order to collaborate with other people from different backgrounds. So you get a business student with um, an ethnography student, with a design student, with a technology student. And you put teams of four or five together like that. And um, amazingly, they seem to be able to collaborate successfully after a dramatically short time. I mean, just the opposite to the story of the siloed individuals in big companies. They seem to be able to collaborate after half a quarter and really be able to do it successfully and find great results from that, which is wonderful to see. So if we can see the kind of concept of de-school-like education spreading, which it does seem to be doing, um, then perhaps our young people will rescue us. Oh, I'm, I'm really excited about the young people. I think, I think we're going to be fine. They're, they're totally amazing. And they totally understand this stuff at a level that none of us old people get. And that's great. <laughs> but, you know, it happened. We, we, you know, we were like old that. old and old, you know. <laughs> we were like that once. And we all, we all have our moments. But I think, I, I do think what's interesting about the, the education piece, and, and it, again, it's something that we did at Business Week where we would, we, you know, we really tried to track this stuff and see who was doing it and really saw the explosion of, of classes that are purporting to kind of cover the design and business spectrum. And I, I, I just want to raise one word of caution, I suppose, in that 
And that what's important here is not that, that you're not trying to create the ultimate all-rounder. You're still, you know, the, the education classes are still about having your deep specialty, but it's just expanding your kind of understanding, the scope of understanding. I think there's been some confusion in the marketplace about what these graduates might do. It's just like, well, are you a designer? Are you what are, are you an analyst? And I, I think. You know, the companies will figure this out, and I think what's important is that the scope of the education is just kind of allowing that that language that language matter that I that I'm banging on about to 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 kind of spread. Yeah, when David Kelly was starting um, the D school, he started working on the idea back in around 2001, I think, and uh, um, as I was teaching a little part time um, to, in classes in the design program at Stanford over the years, he said asked me to do a little research and see if there were other places in the world that had used similar ideas in the past. Um, and I looked around, looked at all the courses that might have been collaborative across disciplines. There was only one that I found that was remarkably similar, and that was at uh, Helsinki University, where they had a University of Technology, another University of Design, another one of Business. And they had classes that were coming together in exactly the same, similar way. Um, and producing designs. And that's now turned into the Alta University. Um, and in fact, Hiro Sotomo, who founded that, has now gone off to Shanghai to do the same thing there. So, so it is kind of the methodology, I think, it does need to have this idea that people come in with their specialty and their expertise, and they keep it. What they're doing is adding some design thinking to help them collaborate with others and come up with solutions which they might not have been able to achieve without those collaborations. Yeah, I think it's super exciting. I think we just have to be aware, though, that you can't, you know, I, I don't know, there's lots of MBA programs that are, you know, MBA in design and all of that, and I think that it's totally admirable that people are trying these things. I just think that we have to be aware of, you know, two years in graduate school is not that long. And two years in graduate school, you're already learning quite a lot. So it's a question of how much you can kind of shoehorn into that very short period of time. And I think it just is behooven to all of the people designing these courses just to be as smart as possible about what, you know, what's really necessary and, you know, thinking about the design of the curriculum smartly. Well, let's ask uh, Fiona and Beth to join us, and they're going to help us understand this in a much richer Sweet. way, I think. <laughs> so Fiona Morrison is um, shimmying. <laughs> shimmying into her Very spot elegant. there. Thank you. And uh, um, she, she's uh, been, until recently, working at JetBlue, and she's been responsible for all those incredible achievements that JetBlue has in terms of the great uh, terminal at JFK, but also the overall design approach and the branding. So I think it's one. It's great to have you bring us the sort of more the other side of the picture, not consulting. Had to do it, make it really happen. So um, please tell us a bit about yourself. I think there's a slide to. Sure, yeah. with the the old headshot. Okay, yes, it's old. <laughs> it's a few years ago. Hair was slightly different. Um, <laughs> just the hair. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I have notes that I'm going to look at so sort of out of the corner of my eye. Um, I think the big thing for me to say here is when you get invited to one of these things is my, I'm not a designer. I never said I was. I've never done a design course. I don't think of myself as a designer. I think of myself, I'm, I'm a brand strategist. That was my job um, at JetBlue until a few weeks ago. Um, but I'm a design enabler. and. Uh, profound sort of cheerleader of good designer and sometimes a groupie um, of design. But I think that's part of the role of uh, being a strategist or a brand strategist or working for a brand like JetBlue and being part of building it is actually sort of seeing that whole and understanding how you need to collaborate to come up with good decisions. You know, at JetBlue, we never really sort of said, let's do some design thinking. It never actually happened like that. Um, my first exposure to design thinking was actually just last year at a, um, an executive um, session at the D School for uh, design thinking for executives and sort of a four-day immersion where they didn't let you have your Blackberry and people were twitching the first two days. And then um, generally by the end of it, sort of raising their hands in praise and <laughs> having evangelical moments, um, sort of going, that was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced and then wondering how the heck they're going to take it back and get everybody else at their business to understand what they were what they were really talking about, that they hadn't just joined a cult for four days and come back. Um, but it, with JetBlue, the, the role, whilst we didn't think of it as design thinking, we had, I think, the foundation in our brand that allowed us to think, that allows the company to think in, that, in a different way than a lot of other companies, which is, you know, with a, it has a mission of to bring humanity back to air travel. 
it's pretty hard to avoid the basis of design thinking, which is you know sort of empathy and humanity when you've got a very short, succinct and quite prescriptive mission statement that nobody can say, I never heard that before, I can't remember it. Um, so it constantly sort of was the thing that drove us back to saying, well, does this service product idea communication help us bring humanity back to air travel? Um, so my role there was to lead a team that was focused on always thinking about what's the customer impact and also what's the crew member impact because if you're going to have a, a service brand, you have to be able to deliver a great service. You know, there's a lot of, JetBlue's not the first, there's a lot of airlines out there that have done some great stuff. Southwest is a incredibly customer-centric. Um, and obviously, uh, Air New Zealand has done work with IDEO on some amazing pieces of product. Um, their cuddle couch, where they turn three economy seats into a couch for long-haul flights, um, is amazing, not just because it's a great piece of design and simplicity, but because they actually did it for economy class travellers, you know, innovations never really happen in the back of the plane. <laughs> it's usually in the pointy bits where they get all that fun, exciting stuff. So when, a, you know, an airline thinking about consumers, thinking about the future of travel has really kind of taken quite a big st step in that. And a funny little airline in a funny little country that really, you know, honestly, um, <laughs> as an Australian, we have a thing with New Zealanders. Um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, there's not stopping airlines here from taking that um, and being forced to take that step. I mean, um, I think technology is forcing them. It's very hard to miss the voice of the consumer these days if you're an airline. They're tweeting, they're Facebook, and they're, they're doing everything. And it's very hard for an airline to, to say, I didn't hear that or people aren't telling me that. So airlines and service industries in general are having to really pick up their game. Um, so just to wrap myself up, I, you know, I, 10 years at JetBlue, um, I just left two weeks ago, I'm still twitching, I'm saying that I'm not sure what to do with myself during the days, but I'm uh, definitely sort of someone who, um, you know, wants to continue in this world of, you know, thinking about consumer-led or human-centric design and working in a, a brand strategic or a strategic brand manner. I'm not sure where that'll be, so any ideas are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Beth Finer is actually has a background uh, from Stanford in the business school. So she joined IDEO to help all those design folks from different disciplines understand a bit more about the business issues. And she's been doing a, a wonderful job of that. So tell us more about yourself, Beth. Sure. So I, I often think that I actually lucked into IDEO. It was kind of a fluke that I ended up there. I, um, someone had emailed me and said, what are you doing after school? And I said, I don't know, what should I do? And they wrote back, you should work at IDEO. And my response was, they don't hire people like me. And so this was a number of years ago, about seven years ago. And so lucky for me, they did hire me and they still do. And I think when I started at IDEO, um, I was on the business side. So I think a lot about our client relationships and the businesses that IDEO is in and how we're growing those. But I always saw my main job as actually that of a translator, right? Because there's this chasm between IDEO and this design world and the businesses. And um, over the past seven years, you actually see that that role becomes less and less necessary because luckily we keep hiring people like me, right? So there's lots of business people running around IDEO now doing business design and actually helping to make ideas even more tangible and have even more impact in the world. But also our clients are becoming much more skilled in talking about design thinking. And so um, I find myself in kind of a new place over the past few years, which is really thinking about emerging areas of IDEO's business. And so working um, with talented uh, designers and areas of content to help bring those businesses to bear for IDEO, um, whether that's thinking more about service. So I've done a lot of work in retail and hospitality banking. I know it's like the big evil. Um, and then also thinking about education, right? So what does that mean in both the private and public sector? And then uh, doing actually work over the past couple of years thinking about IDEO's business in South America. So it's been an interesting transition for me to actually watch kind of that trans translation role become less and less necessary, but also one that's really filled with hope as well. So that's me. Thank you. So what are we going to talk about? <laughs> you, you got us here. Well, I have, a, I have a question, if that's... Can I ask Sounds a question? Um, and it's for you, Fiona. Oh, um, yes. I just wondered if you could be more specific about actually how, how you worked within JetBlue, what response you met, having been at mm -hmm. your, you know, your D school, 
experience. So when you went back, what happened? How did you, how did you make that work? Um, I wish I could say I went back and they all stopped and listened and said, oh my goodness, aren't you brilliant, let's do it. <laughs> um, you know, let's throw out everything in the meeting room and turn it into a collaboration centre. They didn't. Um, but I think what did happen, and what JetBlue has been doing over the course of the last couple of years, is sending people from across different disciplines within the company. So the head of um, airport operations went and did the D-School and came back waving his hands in the air and sort of um, doing the sort of the dance. And I think... Um, <laughs> One of the design things, thinking dance. Design thinking. We can do that later. Um, <laughs> design thinking dance. But I, I think you know, and it went across a whole lot of different disciplines within the company. And what that's done, whilst any change is never as quick as you'd like it to be, it started to build this sort of idea that. It, it's, it's okay to stop and think, it's okay to go into abstract. So these people are now in meetings going, hang on, could we, you know, we're not going to about to follow the steps of the process necessarily, it'd be nice if you had the time, but the elements of the process are coming in. And, um, you know, I would say that it might not always win, but at least it's discussed. And I think historically JetBlue, as a result of sort of that DNA of the humanity back to air travel, has a good foundation for going, hang on, do we have to do it like everybody else? You know, just because other airlines do it doesn't mean it's good. Um, is that what people really want? So that combined with sort of this interdisciplinary team is definitely helping. Cool. So what's it like doing it with a bank? Um, it can be hard, actually. I think, well, I think there are a lot of industries that are ripe for change and they're very excited about it, but they don't necessarily know how to change. And so um, I think we we see, right, there are so many industries that haven't changed, right? So you look at stores like Borders that are out of business, right? And they, they, they didn't change and they actually had all of the assets right in front of them years ago, but they didn't see how things were moving. And so I think we're lucky that banks come to us and ask the questions, but um, I think it goes back to how deep that understanding is within their organizations in terms of their willingness to move or to change. So there are definitely organizations that are willing to do that. I think oftentimes they're so focused on the, what's new, what's the new product or service that we can deliver from this. And so we've had instances in banks where they create and they have this wonderful innovation team that we work with. And then that innovation team is very successful in rolling out a new product or a new service. And then what happens is six months later, all that whole team is promoted. And so that team doesn't exist anymore. And so I think, um, you know, there are successes that you can see there, but generally um, those successes are not uh, part of the fabric of the culture of an organization, and so it's very difficult for them to be maintained over time. I think that a lot of the um, problems that one sees with any form of consulting and design is whether it actually gets implemented. I mean, um, there's often a chasm between the people who come to the project and enjoy it, like your visit to the D School, mm -hmm. but the people who are on a project in a design consulting team from the client side, who really sort of get value out of it because they participate, but then they take it back to the rest of the organization and try and implement something, and this it's just a different world. They don't, there's, there's so many stories where things don't really happen. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you have any comments about how one could break those barriers. I, I mean, I, I, you started me thinking about a project that we actually did with IDEO, um, which was um, for the development or the sort of evolution of the JetBlue um, uh, product, which was even more legroom, just to make it that sort of even more product. And uh, we did a lot of work with IDEO, and it was a phenomenal project for me to work on. But it's got this sort of lofty notion, oh, they're off doing design thinking stuff, they're going to come back with something that's operationally very challenging or difficult. And I think um, what we found was that I'm sure the IDEO team sort of handed their baby across to us and then we kind of just, you know, chopped off its legs, um, <laughs> basically. But, you know, I think you have to, it, for a business, there's always other parameters. There's always other parameters that aren't, whilst you might have discussed them in the design thinking process or in the sort of the collaboration process, there's always other parameters that get in the way, damn them, and sort of ruin that, that moment. And I think it's just a matter of being aware of the parameters, taking, you know, having a, a lofty goal and hopefully, hopefully thinking that you're taking one step at a time as opposed to reaching the immediate goal. I'm just thinking of JetBlue in that regard. You can bite off certain elements and maybe get that, that greater. 
Yeah. Good. I mean, I it's it's funny because hearing that, right? You're like you hand over the baby, and I guess I think my hope is always that, um, or I think we used to do that a lot, and we used to. It's it's actually takes a lot more care to make sure that the people are involved in like birthing that baby mm -hmm. and like creating that baby and all those other parts of that experience. And um, so I, you know, there's lots of theories around lean startup and agile design and versus like a waterfall approach, which is that just like toss it over the fence and like hope mm -hmm. it lands safely. And I think we spend a lot more of our time now actually starting to create buy-in really early and making sure that the right stakeholders are there. And there are sacrifices that happen on both sides, but I think at the end of the day, that makes for a more seamless experience. And hopefully that because the right people are in the room, there is there is more buy-in. But you do at some point have to let go, right? I do at the end of the day, we are a consulting firm, and I think we care so much about those things having impact in the world, but it becomes someone else's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, you know, there's always a tension there for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think there's, I think that, you know, there's lots of theories about how to nurture innovation and you know there's all sorts of discussion about how how companies should do it you know should you should you have like a kind of innovation unit that's totally separate from the main company should you have you know how how then do you <clears throat> do you put that back into the host without it being kind of either you know squashed or overwhelmed and I, I think you know people are pretty smart about this but it's really important that you know the culture piece doesn't get overlooked at any point because the cult the the culture of a company is going to dictate whether something is successful or not and making you know consultants can only do so much and they need to make sure that the people who are actually going to do the hard work are on board yeah. and that they that they are coming up with the ideas this isn't about dictating you know you should do this it'll be great that's not going to help that's not going to help anybody yeah i think is people are pretty confused at the moment by the success of apple no, because that's such a powerful thing, and the stories about design being so important in terms of contributing to that success are so obviously visible. Um, but, it, but it gives the impression that it's very much an individual personality dominating the decisions and choices in order to achieve that success. And then you look at something that's the opposite to that, which is the entire structure of, say, Silicon Valley, which is a, an engine, actually, of innovation, has been for a long time. 30, 40 years, 50 years even. Um, and there, really, the, the sort of interdisciplinary teamwork that we're describing with design thinking was always the structure of the startup company. Mm -hmm. Because what they did with any startup company was hire the VP of every different discipline, mm -hmm. put them together in a room, and tell them to get on with it, you know? And they will not tell them. I mean, they would do it together. Very much a collaborative process. So, so the sort of engine of innovation that we see in, va in the Valley is very kind of contrasting, at least intellectually, with the idea of Apple's success. And uh, can you comment on that? I I, I, ooh, I I can to a certain extent in that I think it's it's the, the they're just genius storytellers, right? I mean, it's not true that everything is done by was done by Steve Jobs when he was there. And Tim Cook, who's taken over the firm since him, was legendary at, at figuring out issues of supply chain and applying just the same rigor that Jobs was doing elsewhere. But Jobs was just a master marketer and, and you know, kind of crafted this narrative um, about the company that's incredibly compelling and really easy for people to grab hold of. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Would you say the startup <laughs> company has something? Similar in structure to the design thinking idea. Go for it. Sorry. Uh, um, yes, and I think I think what the start. What, okay. <laughs> um, I think also what they do that what, that is so interesting is that they have this flexibility that that we talk about that as being so critical to kind of successful businesses where you can try something and if it doesn't work you can try something else pretty quickly and you can iterate really really rapidly in order to make success. And I think one of the interesting things I've been seeing out of the Valley is this designer's fund, which is where, you know, it's a VC fund which is specifically based on having a designer, an engineer, and a business person in a room together to see what happens. And I think, you know, we're gonna see some super interesting stuff that's being driven by design. And that in itself will kind of elevate design a little bit further up the discussion pole um, and, you know, m help design to have a, a more central, central place at the table. Yeah. I think it's it's also interesting when we think about Silicon Valley or an Apple versus I think what happens at most large organizations in terms of how they think about innovation, right? They go and they hire this person who's going to run innovation and then they, you know, they create this silo for them to sit. And 
I, I think the, the most successful of those individuals actually start to create or find their own networks outside that maybe they're not competitive in other industries, but they start to create their own cohort because they actually don't have one. And so I think one of the great things about the Silicon Valley model is, right, like everyone is on board, right? Everyone is bought in. And I think when you're in a larger organization actually trying to fundamentally change the culture, you're kind of a lone ranger, right? You're writing by yourself. And it's a really difficult place to be. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's a caution that I look at the, our clients who have put that into place and I worry about them a little bit because it's a huge responsibility and then it's so easy to just say oh you're gone like that didn't work out so well like let's hide that somewhere else and um, I don't know it's 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 tough because you can't not everyone can start anew to create the culture that would be necessary to actually breed that that type of behavior across an organization what, what about designing government Oh, designing government. Oh my gosh, that's a hard one. We've been uh, dabbling in that a little bit. And I think, um, I think you have to change your expectations about what you can change and what, what, what impact looks like, right? It, because the level, the scale, the, the number of people there who, who are kind of making decisions and you know, all of a sudden you think you're doing this project and everyone's already over here and it, it's, it's just a different monster altogether. I think actually it comes back to a piece around language is really important and it might be a different tone on language, but it's all about saying, how can we make this simple so that everyone at every level of government, right? If you think about an agency that you might be working with can actually understand what their place is within that process, where they fit um, within that you know, monster at some level, right? Like how they can contribute um, so that they see what you see. Let's There's get a, some ooh, other people on, to join us. Um, I think they're going to bring the microphones up to the side here. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please come up to the mic. And remember to say who you are before you s start. Um, in the meantime, Helen is going to say. In the meantime, I have a very important point I'd like to make. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was actually just to talk about government a bit more in that... Um, there's a really interesting um, initiative called Code for America that's happening, which isn't specifically design, yeah. but it's about bringing this kind of, it's about bringing design thinking to the problem of government and the problem of citizenship. And I, w I was listening to Jennifer Parker, who is the founder of Code for America talk the other day, and she was describing this initiative where they, they like, it's kind of goofy, they like named fire hydrants in Boston <clears throat> and they got you know they allowed people to adopt a fire hydrant so when it snowed you went and dug out Al your fire hydrant mm -hmm. <laughs> and you kind of had you know you had kind of ownership and you felt very responsible for Al and you didn't want him to be submerged and they kind of you know they added all the gaming stuff that everybody has to do these days but it's been enormously successful and, and it was one of the Code for America volunteers um, who designed this and rolled it out in two and a half months just to see what would happen um, and nine cities have adopted this and, and, and are kind of using it in, in appropriate ways for their cities. Like Hawaii is having, you know, kind of flood warnings are, are being used in Hawaii and Chicago has it for snow. And so it's being adopted at a rate, an exponential rate. And the people from government had told Jennifer that, you know, this would have taken two and a half years and cost millions of dollars if they'd done it the traditional way of going through the layers of bureaucracy needed. And I think what's interesting is they're just, you know, these are kids, you know, they're, they're just trying it and they're doing it. And I think this is the kind of, this is, this is why we're not, we're not all lost, because the kids can do this kind of thing. Please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew Robinson. I teach at Parsons and I'm an artist and a designer. I, I have a, a couple visceral reactions to things that you've been saying. Um, I want to just straight out say um, it's interesting to hear you talk about ideas about strategy and innovation and business. And I was struck by your talking about language. I personally feel really uncomfortable with the term design thinking. Um, many people do. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I feel uncomfortable is because um, well, some of the things that you've mentioned up here, uh, the immediate assumption when you use that language that people who practice design are not thinking. That's not true. It's a so, bit rude, too. Yeah, really. it, it, quite. <laughs> um, but I, I think it brings up a larger issue about, um, for me, when I hear about what you guys describe, about branding, about strategy, about innovation and business, that's what it is. It's strategy and business and innovation. 
which is genius. It's really important. But it's not design, from my point of view. For example, when you talked about Ava Zizel being intuitive, I actually totally disagree with that. When you think about what she did, so when she went to the Soviet Union before she got thrown in a gulag, she was hired by that government to design and innovate their entire ceramics industry. And one of the asks was, we need to be really efficient about how we produce wares for the people of the Soviet Union. She also did things with the way that the teacup handle is actually designed that were really specific design problems. So to say that because her evolution as a designer didn't change radically because of one tea set sold a crate and barrel, I think is a little disingenuous. So my question really is how, what is design thinking when it comes down to the practical, I, I guess I'm just trying to find a different word for it. Um, the other thing that I struggle with, uh, and I'll, I'll sit down after this, is um, one of the things that I've seen, uh, I co-taught a class with Columbia and Parsons, where MBA students and design practitioners work together. And what struck me was the teams that worked really well to design luxury products for this class were the ones who actually collaborated in the studio making things because the, the business people were able to learn about the material and about the production and make decisions about that. Um, my concern is that in education, through high school and undergrad and even graduate school, that we're kind of de-skilling generations of people in the United States and, and the UK and even in Europe. Um, and my concern is design thinking feels like it's just trying to frame something that's not really design. And I'll, that's just kind of my comment and question. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, profound. Um, I stand corrected about Ava. I'm sure you're absolutely right. But I really feel stand, uh, stand corrected by what Helen said about the difference between the two halves of the brain. I do believe that it's all mixed, you know, that everybody does both, that the scientist uses right brain just as much as left, um, but there just is a, a difference in balance, and it helps to explain it. Perhaps that's why we need a word like design thinking, to help us explain the different in terms of kind of operation. And to me, it's fairly simple in that when I graduated from design school in the 60s, my assumption was that I would be designing products that were probably made in metals and plastics for the whole of my life, but that somebody else would tell me what to do, that the boss or the client would say, design this cattle bill, design this cooker bill, design this iron bill, and I would then be the designer doing the design. But I wouldn't be expecting myself to try and help decide what to design. And that to me is the difference. The practice is about doing the designing, but the design thinking is the bit where you're trying to help decide what to design. <clears throat> That's a different question. Of course, one can come together with the other, and usually does, um, that you'd find that most designers, particularly if they're a bit entrepreneurial, like Scott Wilson, will be deciding what to do and doing it. But there is a difference in the methodology, and I do think we need a label to separate them. I would add that I agree with you that I think the term is terribly difficult and really causes more problems often than it solves. But I think that I agree with Bill that it's important to have some kind of language around this, and maybe it's not the right term, but. But, um, but the practice is very different. And I also agree with you that um, it's, it, it's terribly important to keep the kind of the craft side of, of design, to keep that up and to make sure that that's still something that people are taught and understand. And it's not necessary for all of the business people to immerse themselves in that and learn that as a separate discipline. But I think it's incredibly important and valuable if, for both sides to have experience within the other. And I think that's what a lot of these courses are trying to do. They're not trying to undercut um, the power or the importance of one discipline or another, but they are just trying to kind of, um, you know, allow a little overlap or kind of some kind of um, segue between them so that people can understand a little bit more about what the other side or the other people are doing. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I think coming from a business background, it's interesting to hear your comments because I, I think what I love about the work that I think all of us do is that sometimes the problems are so complex, it's so difficult to understand what is tangible about it. And when you can 
pair the design piece with the thinking and the process and the methodology, you can make those very, very complex concepts tangible. And so to me, it's hard because I think so much of the work that I'm involved in, that IDEO is involved in, doesn't have a, an end product, an end thing, right, that sits on the shelf. It, these are these are complex systems. Some of them actually don't ever appear like in air, you know, and so you would never be able to recognize it. And but to me, the thing that's wonderful about it is how expansive we can we can be when we borrow from design. And so, um, you know, I think the distinction is really interesting. And I, I I think we hear from our teams all the time how much they miss being able to always make beautiful things because of the constraints that were sometimes handed or given. Um, so it's, it's just, it's an interesting balance. But I, for me, it's all about a place of inspiration to kind of broaden that set. Yeah, I mean, I think you've said it all, but I, I think the, the thing that came to my mind when you were speaking, because I'm someone who shares your passion for the importance of language, of finding the right way to say something, because the foundation of good design for a client to a designer or however the, the sort of relationship is to be able to communicate your need and you to be able to communicate back to me what you're seeing, hearing, feeling and, and wanting to create. But I think um, it's not so much us evil business people taking away from you, designer, it's actually um, hoping that we can learn a little from you and expand our horizons rather than being sort of locked in to this must do business but actually going, well, is there another way to look at this? Is there a way to learn from the sort of the designer to, to step back and take a, a broader view? I don't, like I said, I'm not a designer. I don't think I am one, but I kind of like hanging around with them. And I, I also think that <laughs> we can learn a lot from them. So I think it's, you know, the language isn't perfect, but the intent I think is, um, is maybe, maybe not perfect, but it, it's, it, it has integrity. And it has to work both ways too. Mm. This isn't just about, yeah. you know, the gracious designer bestowing their wisdom on the, you know, the dumb business person. This is this is about the business person informing the designer too, and, and helping the designer to come up with better ideas. Mm. This has to be an equal partnership, and I think that's something that is often missing too. Uh, you know, and this is that kind mm. of defensive mechanism that people kind of, because people don't want to, you know, say that they don't know something. People get super defensive, and that's super unhelpful. One of the slogans that I liked um, at IDEO about the project room, you know, the separate space where all the stuff in your project is on the walls or around the place, and you can go into that room and you instantly remember everything about what you thought yesterday about that project. Um, but uh, we have a little slogan saying, check your disciplines at the door of the project room. Um, because if you don't do that, then that sense of intense collaboration between people is still siloed. You know, so that really if you can achieve that, then you're fluent. If you're able to leave your discipline behind, if you collaboratively come up with ideas and you don't remember who came up with the idea, was it the business person who came up with it? Was it the designer? Was it the human factor scientist? I don't know. We just came up with it together. So if you've got that level of collaboration, then you learn how to do it, I think. I think your illustration earlier on about everybody, when it gets to the tough point, the Blackberries are like, oh, suddenly this very important email must be thumbed, um, is that, that very point of you, you get up against the wall of what's my discipline, what do I know, uh, rather than sort of pushing through it and saying, well, I don't know damn thing, so let's see what happens. There must be somebody else who wants to say something. Yes, please. Come to our microphone. Yes. My name is Melinda Zofel, and I'm an architecture student at Cornell. Um, and one of the major shifts, obviously, uh, recently has been the shift toward computers and technology and collaboration through technology. And in our first year, we weren't allowed to touch computers. We had to draw everything by hand. And then later on, we moved into that, whereas the year below us, they started out in computers. And so I'm wondering how you think computers and technology have changed design education and therefore creativity in design itself. Totally on you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think computers are just tools. So, you know, I mean, I, I went to school at the time when I learned to draw with airbrush, with gouache, with watercolor, um, with r ruling pens. And then a few years later, none of that was any use. I was using magic markers. And a few years after that, none of that was any use. I was using computers. So who cares? I mean, it's just another tool. So if you think of it as a tool, then 
fine. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't get in the way. It, in fact, is a wonderful set of tools. I mean, you can do things that we didn't used to be able to. You can do them so much quicker. You can do them in wonderful new ways. But thinking of it as a necessary component that you are allowed to have or not allowed to have seems to me the wrong kind of way of thinking about it. That's what I was going to say. Mm. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I love this talk. So. And you are? Uh, I'm Angela Ye of Ye Ideology. We're a design and strategy recruitment firm. So we work with corporations and consultancies all across the US and internationally. I love the term design thinking. And from what we see, whether you are an industrial designer, or service design specialist, strategist, engineer, we see that when people are more multilingual, and in our firm, we call it multilingual, being able to talk. If you're an industrial designer and you can talk engineering, you can talk product development and marketing, you can relate to them better. And we find that in any sector, we saw, find that most successful people are more multilingual. It doesn't detract from the, what they know and what they do, but it just adds to their purview of what they do. So I think also for business to understand the value of design, it's better for them to understand it to some level. For us to appreciate accounting and finance, I don't want to be an accountant, but I understand and respect exactly what they do more when I know some level of it. Um, and actually, to that woman's question, uh, having seen design, different businesses use different skills, and we, we always still see people who are missing that hand skill, and it's still really rare. But rendering abilities, if they do get better, and if you're really mastering it, yeah, you can be good at it. But sometimes rendering, if you're not mastering it, it hinders your ability to be creative. Yeah. Thank you. Comments? Hi. I am Alice Gottesman, and I'm not really a anything in particular except interested in the topic. <laughs> but I thought that this gentleman was really excellent in what he said. And I sort of wonder why isn't this like creative, why isn't the term instead of design thinking, which is so elevated, which I think is so, you talk about language, nobody knows what a designer is to begin with. So mm -hmm. it's like, it, there's no, that language, the, the word design is probably the most Difficult word to define, almost. So why aren't we just talking about creative solving, creative sol problem solving? I mean, why are we elevating it to this kind of design thinking? I mean, it just seems like we all, as we all once had that ability to create, and then all of a sudden, it's people are frightened of it, as you were saying. They, you know, sort of work with their blackberries and things. But it's just so simple. So I'm just sort of confused, and I think that. I just really appreciate what you were saying, and... <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. I think that was what I was trying to say in, in, in my earlier comments, was you know, this, it's really time to, to, um, to rein it in and to start talking, in, you know, I say talking in English because I'm from England, but just talking in plain language again and making sure that we're all speaking at the same level and we're all understanding what we're talking about. The thing about design thinking is it's now in the ether. People have embraced it. People have adopted it. People really like it, and so that's fine. So you don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's worth kind of getting embroiled in some semantic discussion. Frankly, if people are into it and they understand it, that's great. I guess there is a problem if people, you know, if there's this backlash that happens because people haven't understood it or they don't know what it means and they thought that they had employed it and then it all went completely wrong. But I don't know that creative problem solving is a ter is any more useful. I don't want to Personally. lose the, the idea of design. I mean, design's had a while to figure out what it is. Um, in fact, I did a short history of design in five minutes recently, looking at the architecture, which was you know, originated in 46th century BC, when the first design of a pyramid was done. That's quite a long time back, 70 centuries. Um, and if you think about industrial design, that's only since the Industrial Revolution. But it's still, a, you know, since the... 1750s, that kind of time, about as age old as this country has been an independent place. Um, so, <laughs> Is that a dig? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a good thing to remember the fact that the evolution of the methods that design uses 
has had a lot of time to get mature. And you, if you lose the word design, then you lose that recognition of that ability to leverage all those methods. You know, Louis XIV um, demanding his architects arrive in time for the next beautiful palace, um, that was the or origin of the charrette, wasn't it? Because they were still doing the drawings after the all-nighter as they were riding along in the cart to, to deliver the drawings. So, so there is a lot about design process that has been around for a long time and is worth remembering, has value. I think our linguistic label needs to stick with that. And design, yes, I mean, let's stick with the word design in this title. Perhaps thinking is something, well, we've, you know, maybe it's the best word we've got so far. I, don't, I think um, one of the things, I think the closer you get to the business world, the closer design thinking comes to not having any meaning at all, right? And the closer, like the words like innovation, you know, you'll be sitting with someone, you know, they'll be like, yeah, we have this awesome innovation. Like next year we're gonna launch a new product. And you're like, what? That's innovation? Okay, that's a great, that's a great starting point. But I, I think one of the ways that, <laughs> it's a starting point. But one of the ways that I always talk about it is this kind of human-centered perspective on design or human-centered design, right? And to me, that helps at least ground it in a place, and maybe it's not the right place to ground it, but um, otherwise I think design thinking, it does, it becomes so high that people attach other meanings to it, whatever they think it is, and then you think you're having one conversation and you're actually having quite a different one. Mm -hmm. I guess the only issue with, sorry, just one other extra point, the issue with creative problem solving is that all problem, all problem solving should be creative. If it's not, then it's not really solving the problem. Right. Uh, if, if you, the, the people online yeah. trying to hear you. Well, I'm glad you're all glad to hear me again. But the thing is, when I understand design in terms of, you know, the process of design, and but it seems like when we're bringing it to the business world, we're no longer designing a product. We're designing a way of thinking. So then it's not. So it's we're talking about creative solutions for how to think about all aspects of life. It's not this, I, I agree with Bill in terms of if you're in the design world and you develop a car or whatever, there's a certain process you go through. Every, every someone, everybody in the design field, a landscape architect, an architect, a fashion designer, you go through school, you get certain training, and it's a, just like you go to business school and you get certain training and you become a professional in your field. When you're trying to get people to just think, in a certain way, but it's not about your training as a designer anymore and the craft that goes with that, that you're now just talking about a way of thinking and you're trying to blend this left brain and right brain and work it in this, it just, it seems to me it's, it's more about creative problem solving that when we're talking about as a way of thinking, not as a discipline, which I respect as a design discipline, or that's where I'm getting confused. So I think what's really important to remember is that not everybody has to do this. This isn't something that everyone has to become expert in. And some people are gonna be really, really super good at this particular form of design. This form of design which helps business, this form of design which can create new businesses, create completely new businesses out of nothing, come up with new concepts for businesses. This is a, sp this is a particular discipline of design and it doesn't in any way denigrate any of the other disciplines of design. And if you don't want to have anything to do with the business world, more power to you. But this is a particular form of design, I think, that is yeah, incredibly powerful. There's room in the world for lots of people who do beautiful lamps. Let's have one more comment or question, thank you. Hi, my name is Ana Mendoza, and um, I'm a graphic designer. Uh, but I'm very interested in um, the question of communication and education. Um, I'm from Venezuela, and we developed a program to um, teach teachers the integration, um, how art and science were integrated together. And we added to the elementary curriculum uh, drawing as a subject matter. And um, uh, the results of the school were amazing. And um, because um, when you go back like to Leonardo da Vinci, who was like the, the, the master scientist and, and designer, and designer thinker that ever existed, I think, uh, 
uh, we try to bring that back because now the scientists are on one side and the designers and artists and are on the other side. And uh, our idea was to educate the science teachers on, on art and how the science was in art and then to educate the artists or the art teachers on how there was science in, in art. And um, we, we brought it up from preschool to high school. And um, I was thinking uh, if you have thought of, since you talked about the education and the integration in the universities, there might still be some damage. There might, there might already be some damage. <laughs> so have you thought of um, uh, that as, a, as a, something that could be addressed? Thank you. Let's have a last word from each of us on that topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, was, I agree. that was one word. <laughs> I mean, I think that would be absolutely amazing. I think it's a tragedy that, you know, art, drawing, all of these, all of these disciplines are kind of lost really quickly. I mean, I know from my personal experience, you know, because I was musical and so I went into music and then I, and, you know, I never did anything to do with art. And I think it's tragic. So, yes, absolutely. You mentioned TED, that you went to TED just recently. If you go to online and you look at TED Talks, the most popular of all the TED Talks was the one by Ken Robinson, when he talks about the fact that we do drum this sort of creativity out of our kids, mm -hmm. that they naturally do these things in elementary school, and then by the time they get to their high school, they've been told not to really continue with that, and only a few oddball people like ourselves will persist enough to fight through that. Um, but he's very eloquent in that. So if you, if you want to hear a, a lovely way to be persuasive on that topic, I recommend you watch that talk. I was just going to say I agree. It'd be, it'd be nice if people weren't, you know, I've, I've said in so many brainstorms where somebody's asked to sketch something and they're like, oh, I can't draw. And you're like, well, you can draw a stick person, you know, and it's this sort of resistance and, and fear of being judged on what you're creating. And I think if you are actually just forced to draw, whether you're good, bad, or indifferent at it, um, it is a, a different process and it allows you to get beyond. Um, and when people do draw stick drawings in brainstorms and you're like, wow, that actually, I actually know what you're talking about, <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's better than words. And I think that's a, a great thing that would be teach business people how to draw. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think all of us probably love the idea of it happening at younger ages, but I also love this idea that Fiona's talking about, about how do you actually start to ask people to do it when they have un think they've unlearned it, mm -hmm. to relearn it. So asking people to draw when they say they can't, or what are the, what are the small steps you can ask people to do on a daily basis or a weekly basis mm -hmm. or a monthly basis? And I think that's how we start to bring it back into our organizations and our cultures is by taking the small steps and showing people that they still have it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, wh what's the smallest barrier, right? What's like the lowest risk thing you could ask someone to do and then start with that. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs>